Good afternoon and welcome to today's bill hearings for the House Health and Government Operations Committee. As you've been hearing from us over the last uh, 50 days or so, this is a virtual committee and sometimes we run into technical difficulties. We ask for your patience um, and uh, know that we are trying to accommodate folks who have uh, made the efforts to speak to us here in the committee. Uh, even though we're meeting on Zoom, our committee is following its usual committee rules of one question and one answer from the panel, not one question and one answer from each panelist. Keep, I'm gonna ask the committees again, uh, committee members again, please keep your questions shorter than the expected answer. Timelines for testimonies, the bill sponsor or designee is allotted five minutes to present the bill. Up to five witnesses will each be allowed to speak for two minutes in support of the bill. Um, please, I ask the panelists to stay in the hearing until the delegates have had the opportunity to ask questions. Next, up to five witnesses will each be allowed to speak for two minutes in opposition and respond to questions. There may also be folks, a panel of uh, favorable with amendment, depending upon the bill. Please conclude your remarks when you see the timer finish. With that, we will begin with the first bill of the day which is House Bill 1403, sponsored by our Vice Chair, Delegate Pena Milnick, Maryland Department of Health, Waiver Programs, Weightless Reduction, and the Weight Act. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Chairman and fellow committee members. I'm pleased to present House Bill 1403 as amended. This legislation requires the Maryland Department of Health to develop a plan to reduce the wait list for eight specified waiver programs by 50%. House Bill 1403 um, will help us end the wait in a comprehensive way. There are currently eight waivers that must be included in the plan. Three of these are administered by the Developmental Disabilities Administration, which are the community pathways, community support, and family supports. As of February 2022, the wait list for these three waivers is approximately 3,600 individuals. The home and community-based options waiver has over 21,000 people waiting for services. The autism waiver has over 6,000 people on the wait list as of September 30th, 2021. These wait lists add up to over 30,000 people waiting for help. 30,000 Marylanders needing services that are being abandoned and neglected. 30,000 loved ones forced to navigate life without serious, you know, navigate life without help and they have serious disabilities and no support. 30,000 people that often die while they're waiting. This bill is critical in addressing the extreme wait list problems we are currently experiencing. The plan required by this bill must include measures to address current problems leading to the long wait list. This includes a plan to recruit and retain providers and changes in reimbursement rates for services under the waiver programs. The bill also requires a time frame to reduce each wait list for each waiver program by 50% and the projected cost of the measures be implemented under the plan. The fiscal note actually states that the plan can be developed with existing resources by the uh, Department of Health. Developing these plans will give people on the way this hope so that we can end the wait. This legislation, again, is critical to ensure that people with disabilities get the services we already have in place in a timely manner. There are long waits from the date an individual gets on a wait list for waiver services to the time they receive the service. The average wait for a person to get on the autism waiver is about 10 years. Mm -hmm. People wait so long on the wait list, they often age out or no longer qualify for the service. These waivers programs are designed to provide people with the support they need and a decade is too long to wait for help. State funding has been cited by many states as the most important factor for increasing waiver capacity. In some states, explicit support from the state legislature has led to funding increases that help reduce the wait list. It is time for us to increase the funds. The um, Senate um, BET yesterday voted favorably, unanimous um, on March 14th, and they fenced over $40 million for the waiver program, and finance is expected to vote today. 
I ask a favorable report. Thank you for allowing me to present this very important bill that will benefit many of our constituents. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, we have a favorable panel, and so we'll wait for questions until after the favorable panel. We're going to be begin with Kenneth Capone. Ken, it's great to see you. Hello, committee members. My name is Ken Capone. I am the director of People on the Go with Maryland, which is Maryland's statewide self-advocacy organization. People on the Go Maryland builds community through diversity and inclusion. We respect the individuality of our members and are committed to making inclusion a priority so that everyone feels comfortable, valued, and heard. People on the Go remains distinct by maintaining a cross-disability strategy that focuses on effecting positive change in the lives of people with and without disabilities. We are here to testify in support for HB 1403 Maryland Department of Health Waiver Programs Weightless Reduction and the Weight Act. I would like to stress the importance of receiving full funding for the wait list because I once was waitlisted for 15 years while my elderly mother cared for me. To make a long story short, when I started receiving services my life changed dramatically. Having the waiver's waitlist reduced by 50% would give many people with disabilities the support and services they need to live a meaningful life of their choosing. Knowing the department is actively working on a plan to reduce the waitlist by 50% inspires hope that individuals currently on the waitlist will receive services in a reasonable time frame. I know people who are currently waiting for services that could help improve their lives tremendously, but without a plan to reduce the waitlist their lives are put on hold. I have been in this field a long time advocating for people with disabilities, and it hurts me knowing that there are people whose lives could be more meaningful if they only had the needed services. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Really appreciate you being here. Um, Rachel London. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Rachel London, the Executive Director of the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council and the chair of the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Coalition, and we are all here in strong support. The council uh, creates change to make it possible for people with developmental disabilities to live the lives they want with the support they need. Waiver programs allow that to happen. My council is primarily people with developmental disabilities and their families, and our council members and thousands of other Marylanders, as you have heard, all need and want services and supports to live, learn, work, and play along, alongside Marylanders without disabilities. This bill can help make that a reality for more people. I'm gonna briefly talk about two um, uh, parts of the bill. The first is the developmental disabilities waiting list. You've heard the number of people waiting for services. Some of those people are in crisis. And while some money does already address those emergencies, a comprehensive approach is needed before emergencies happen. The second part of that is you know, the COVID pandemic exacerbated, as you have all heard, uh, an already existing workforce crisis. It's also already exhausted all of us. More families are supporting their children, young and older, at home. Uh, so the bill, as amended, does um, include measures to build the capacity of providers, which is critical. The second part is the autism waiver. The council sits on a variety of committees, commissions about the autism waiver. It was established 21 years ago to help children with autism get early intervention services. And as you've heard, people are now waiting 10 years or more for those services. Uh, for all those reasons, the council strongly supports this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Megan Andrade, please. Hi, my name is Megan Andrade. I'm a mother of three young adults with developmental disabilities, and I also work at the ARC Baltimore, where we provide a number of support services. So my son, Devin, just um, waited nine years on the autism waiver registry. Um, Devin actually turns 21 this month, so as you may or may not know, that's the end of your eligibility for the autism waiver. And typically, 
that's the beginning of when people start to become eligible for the community pathways waiver. Now, Devin needs a lot of 24 seven support. And because we went through many, many years where I was his only support, I was the only provider of any service, nothing in the home, nothing outside of the home, no respite. We got stuck in extreme crisis for several years and we truly almost died. I mean, we really, we were drowning and that's the best way to put it. Because we were drowning for so many years, Devin was able to get into the community pathways waiver just two years ago when he was 19. But for, and, and we're not the only family in such extreme crisis. And the crisis, like Rachel mentioned, isn't always enough to get you into that waiver. And there are many families like mine, but think of also the thousands of families and people with developmental disabilities who aren't in such extreme crisis, but who need support in order to work or engage with their communities they're waiting even longer. Those are the people waiting 10, 15 years for services. And while they may not be drowning, they certainly are unable to work. Their families are unable to work, um, you know, and the list goes on. So I really, I, I hope that everyone supports this waiver. And if you have any more questions, um, as I said, I do have other adult children and the stories could go on about why the wait list needs to end. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for your testimony and for your story and making it real for us. Um, Randy Ames, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Pendergrass and committee members for providing me the opportunity to testify on House Bill 1403. My name is Randy Ames. I'm an assistant managing attorney with Disability Rights Maryland, the state's nonprofit legal service program providing um, access and advancing the rights, uh, civil rights of people with disabilities. House Bill 1403 is crucial in many ways. It would address the weight Maryland, Marylanders are experiencing to access the medically necessary care they need. Um, it ensures people are being served by the appropriate programs that would meet their needs, and it would avoid people with disabilities having to experience a healthcare crisis or be institutionalized to access services. As of January 2022, there, was there were approximately 1,200 unused home and community-based option waiver slots, despite the fact that there's a wait list of over 20,000 people to access this particular waiver. Unfortunately, historically, Maryland, the Maryland Department of Health has been unable and unwilling to address this wait list and administer the program efficiently. House Bill 1403 is an opportunity for this state to get back on track and serve the participants waiting um, current and potential participants of these waivers. House Bill 1403 is, a is part of a larger strategic plan to improve the state's home, home and community-based service programs. In particular, Maryland's investment of the almost $234 million, ARP, million, dollar of, ARP, million dollars of ARPA funds to expand and supplement our home and community-based service programs. Disability Rights Maryland serves um, Partic Medicaid participants across the spectrum, younger individuals as well as older individuals and folks who are facing having to go into an institution to access services. You know, the House Bill 1403 um, provides an opportunity to address that and resolve these issues. For these reasons, DRM is asking for a favorable vote of home House Bill 1403. Thank you all. Thank you, thanks for your testimony. Um, the last speaker on this panel is Lauren Callens. Thank you, Chair Cullison and members of the committee. I'm Lauren Callens with the Maryland Association of Community Services, representing over 100 providers statewide of supports to people with IDD in the community. So in the DD world here in Maryland, there are over 200 providers of community services with, to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the very mission of these providers is to support people in the community. And they do that through personal supports, employment supports, other meaningful day, residential supports, or some combination. And most, if not all of them, would welcome the opportunity to support more people. But lack of staffing and other resources make that an impossibility. DD providers, like others, have faced longstanding staffing shortages, as this committee well knows, due to chronic underfunding. But the pandemic has decimated our workforce. 
our organization did a, a survey back in January, which revealed that amongst max members, the average vacancy rate is 26%. One in three reported vacancy rates between 30 and 60%, and an alarming 10% reported vacancies between 50 and 60%. And now Target has announced that in some parts of the country, they will be offering starting wages of $24 an hour. DD providers simply cannot compete at current rates. Without adequate funding to attract and retain a qualified workforce, it will not be possible to significantly reduce the waiting list. And so we are deeply appreciative of the sponsor's leadership on this bill and the inclusion of important amendments that would ensure that the plan envisioned by this bill includes an analysis of what is needed by existing providers to expand capacity and bring more people off the waiting list, an assessment of whether there is a need to recruit and retain new providers, and any needed changes to reimbursement rates in order to ensure provider capacity to support people with IDD. We look forward to a time when every Marylander who wants and needs DDA funded supports will be able to access those supports when needed. And this bill will take us um, in an important step, take a, an important step in that direction. We urge your favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, okay, I'm um, going to now open it up for questions from the committee and Delegate Kelly has been waiting very patiently. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My question is for the sponsor of the bill. Um, and I'm sorry if it's a bit of a softball, but my question is really, um, isn't this the greatest bill I've ever seen in my life? I love it so much. Um, didn't I just note earlier in the session that the wait list for the home and community-based services options waiver was unconscionable and that I felt like we really needed to do something. And isn't it wonderful that this approach doesn't pit people with disabilities against people who need long-term care services for the aging for funding and instead we're able to come up with a solution that that addresses all of the waiver programs and aren't you um, a wonderful champion for pulling this all together thank you <laughs> well thank you i i have to credit um delegate guy gazzoni and delegate um, and i'm sorry senator um, gazzoni and senator zucker for their leadership and i am very honored um to be able to lead it in the house and you know, we have said in this committee for more than 15 years, and we have heard the testimonies, which breaks your heart. Here we have an amazing opportunity to do it in a comprehensive manner and really start finding solutions. So thank you so much for your question. And thank you for leading because this has been your baby as well. Thank you, Delegate. And Delegate Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair Delegate um, Pinyamonic for this bill. Um, Two-part question, number one, um, Montgomery County, as you may have read, um, is asking for more explicit instructions and an amendment to, as they say, have the plan address existing barriers to the HCBS waiver participation, including an analysis of the staffing shortages and backlogs and a prospective course of action, which I guess is what the plan is to implement the recommendations raised by the analysis. So the first part is, are you accepting that amendment or do you feel that that kind of explicit um, ask is not required? That is the amendment. One of the amendment does that. It's gonna look at the assessment of whether each waiver program needs to recruit and retain new providers. So it is already doing that. Okay. And then the second part is, um, is your optimism about the bill that asked for a plan, um, you know, based on the fact that you said that Senator Gazzoni uh, from Bud Budget and Taxation is, is committed to putting some money into it and that we're going to actually get a actionable plan? I mean, where's the optimism that having a plan will actually lead to action in the lifetime of the people who are on the waiting list? I think the optimism comes that it's about time that we do this and make it a priority. And Senator um, Zucker and Gazzoni made it a priority by fencing off $40 million for this. And the amendments um, you know, really call for a plan that is intelligent, that will do a comprehensive assessment. And what's really great about this bill is that the fiscal note says that the Department of Health can do the plan with existing resources. So the monies they have been fenced off won't be used for that. So yes, I'm very optimistic about its chances. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Oh, thank you, Delegate. Uh, thank Delegate you. Luz Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the sponsor of this bill just 
used the phrase that I was going to ask about. I was so pleasantly surprised to see that despite the fact that services now will be offered to a larger audience, there is no additional fiscal note. It can be done with existing budgeted resources. That's not something we see very often. <laughs> How did you do that? I'm gonna plead the fifth on that. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Are there I any might other... repeat it tomorrow, but thank you. <laughs> um, you. You might want to meet in the hallway. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, there are. Um, there is no other panelists on this committee, so that completes the hearing on um, House Bill 14, oh, 1403. And we will move to House Bill 1397, also Delegate Pena Milnick. This is health insurance, prescription insulin drugs, limits on copay and coinsurance, insulin cost reduction act. And I believe uh, Madam Vice Chair has delegated Miriam As Asi to present this bill uh, yes. on her behalf. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and um, Dr. Asi is an intern in my office. She's also an internist and, um, and she's ready to present. Thank you for allowing her the opportunity. Thank, thank you for allowing her the opportunity. So Dr. Essie. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present House Bill 1397. My name is Mariam Asi. I'm a general internal medicine physician and a graduate student of public health. House Bill 1397 caps the cost share for prescription insulin for individuals with eligible health insurance plans to no more than $30 for a 30-day supply. Over 10% of adults in Maryland suffer from diabetes. That's more than 500,000 individuals. Without insulin, a person with, uh, living with type 1 diabetes would die. It's as simple as that. A person living with type 2 diabetes may not need insulin at first, but eventually they'll need it to maintain adequate control of their blood sugars. Uncontrolled blood sugars, uh, as this committee might know, in the long term leads to debilitating and costly complications, including blindness, kidney failure, nerve damage, lower limb amputations, stroke, heart attacks, and, and most importantly to me, human suffering. The cost of insulin in Maryland and in the US is almost 10 times higher than other developed countries. Over the past dec decade or so alone, the price of insulin has tripled, and these price increases have been far higher than what inflation rates have been. When it comes to insulin, one of the main reasons it's so expensive is that there's this vulnerable population of patients for whom insulin is a life-saving drug and not just a luxury. They're willing to pay anything to just get access to insulin because without it, they can't survive. Coupled with this, there's, there are only three companies controlling the insulin market in the US. What these drug companies do is they take the same insulin, um, a drug that's been around for 100 years, and they make new versions of it with little to no innovation so they can patent the same drug over and over again. By doing this, they make it very difficult for generic insulin products to enter the market. In a monopoly with significant regulatory and legal barriers to entry of competing generic products, these drug companies can set whatever price they want. Please keep in mind, this monopoly is not over a luxury item, but a life-saving medication. The drug pricing problem starts with pharmaceutical companies, but it doesn't end there. In fact, all the middlemen in the supply chain, from the wholesaler to the pharmacy benefit manager to the pharmacy, they all benefit from a high, higher price. So at the end of the day, everyone benefits except the patient. It's time to change this equation and put the patient first, as we should be doing, and this should start now with cost capping legislation at the state level. At least 15 other states have already passed similar legislation. Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Kentucky, Maine, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New Mexico, New York, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, and West Virginia. In fact, two major insurance carriers have cost capping policies for their beneficiaries here in Maryland. We know of no evidence that such policies have impacted premiums, both in Maryland and in other states. 
Even the federal government is following suit. The U.S. House of Representatives recently passed legislation that would cap insulin copays to $35 for a 30-day supply. Maryland is lagging behind, and Marylanders with diabetes are losing their lives and livelihoods as a result. The status quo is no longer a viable option. The cross-filed bill already passed third reader with unanimous support in the Senate. I urge a favorable report on House Bill 1397. Thank you for allowing me to present this important bill. Um, I'd like to give the rest of my time to Dr. Mariana Sokal. Thank you, Dr. Asi. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Soka? Hello, good afternoon. Chair Pendergrass, Vice Chair Pena Melnick, and members of the committee, it is a great pleasure to be talking with you today. I'm Mariana Sokal, MD, PhD. I'm a physician and a scientist at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In a recent study, one of every four patients living with diabetes taking insulin said they took less insulin than they needed in the last year because of the cost. The study also showed that all patients from the uninsured to those with private health insurance had similarly reported um, insurance uh, affordability problems because of the cost. So how did we get to a point that even privately insured individuals report trouble affording their insulin? The answer is how drug prices work in the United States. Here, the drug manufacturer can set the price that they want for a drug, and that's called the list price. But then the manufacturer cuts deals with health insurers. In exchange for covering the drug, they offer lower prices. And the final lower price is confidential. It's a secret between the drug manufacturer and the insurer. Patients don't know about it. But here's the catch. When patients must pay for their insulin, they pay on the basis of the high list price, not on the lower discounted price negotiated by the insurer. And the difference between these two prices is in normals. Here's a concrete example. In 2016, Novo Nordisk disclosed prices for their insulin, Novolog. The list price was $450 per vial, but the price to insurers was a third of it at about $150. If the insurer required that the patient pay the 25% coinsurance to get Novolog, the patient would be paying $112.50, and the insurer would need to pay less than $40 to complete the $150 negotiated price. In this case, the patient would unknowingly be paying a, almost the total drug cost, three-fourths of it. And this is a very common situation. One of my own studies found that in the Medicare program, the average coinsurance charge for insulin was 28% of the drug cost to patients. What is even worse, when the patient has a high deductible health plan or is uninsured, the person will be on the hook for the full cost of the insulin, which means three times more than the manufacturer is charging health insurance plans for the same drug. It is important that we recognize how our, how our current drug pricing structure penalizes consumers. Patients have absolutely no negotiating power in this situation. Placing a cap on how much patients can be charged for their insulin will provide much needed relief for people who need insulin to stay alive. It will also decrease cost from the medical complications and lost productivity that result from this unaffordability crisis. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be speaking about this important bill. Thank you very much uh, for your really clear explanation of what is a complex um, chain of pricing. I appreciate that. Uh, I am going to go to James Gutman, please. Good afternoon, Chair Colson and members of the HGO. I'm Jim Gutman. I'm a member of the Executive Council and Lead Healthcare Advocacy Volunteer for AARP Maryland. And before my retirement for 25 years, I edited, published, and owned subscription financial and regulatory newsletters about US healthcare, including about prescription drugs. Before that, I was with Johnson & Johnson as a manager of editorial services. But more significantly here, I've been a SHIP volunteer counselor, Medicare PDP counselor for the past six fall open enrollment periods. I'm here today representing AARP Maryland and its 850,000 members in support of HB 1397. And we thank Delegate Pena Melnick for sponsoring this important legislation. You've heard about all the problems about the pricing of uh, insulin. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the effects 
and it's worse than in the commercial market than in the uh, Medicare market where I have firsthand experience. I see those problems when I counsel beneficiaries for the Howard County ship. Several of the seniors I, uh, I have assisted are diabetics and they are in such problems that they wind up going to the emergency room because they can't afford insulin and that taxes the whole medical system. In the Medicare area, the only price aid for Maryland's and insulin users uh, is 20, in, of the 21 PDPs, seven have a $35 monthly copayment limit, and that's only in any enhanced plans with higher premiums. But even this sounds good compared to the commercial market, which this plan would uh, correct. The uh, $30 copay would make a big difference here, and it's going to apply regardless of the amount of, and type of insulin needed to fill the uh, Maryland resident's prescription. The result is likely to be big gains in residents' ability to stay on their insulin medication regimen, and that's vital for the older uh, Marylanders ARP represents. We urge you, therefore, to uh, give a favorable report to House Bill 1397. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Kirk Robbins, please. Hi. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Catherine Kirk Robbins, and I am one of the deputy directors at Maryland Healthcare for All. I want to thank you for the opportunity today to testify in support of House Bill 1397. And I also would like to thank Vice Chair Pena Melnick and Senator Lamb for sponsoring this important legislation. As you all well know, and you heard from uh, doctors Asi and Sokal, the insulin is a life-sustaining drug for people with diabetes. And unfortunately, over the years, we've seen its price uh, skyrocket. And as a result, many Marylanders have struggled to afford their insulin, either having to cut back on other necessities or even ration their insulin, which can have devastating health consequences. Uh, by establishing a $30 copay for a 30-day supply of insulin, which this bill does, we would help to ensure that Maryland families aren't facing burdensome costs and help those who depend on insulin afford their medication. I also want to add that we know that insulin pricing is a complicated issue that involves all members of the prescription drug supply chain. And so in addition to this important bill, we would encourage that insulin be reviewed by Maryland's landmark Prescription Drug Affordability Board, which thanks to your leadership was established in 2019. And that way a comprehensive solution to the issue can be found. With that said, this is a very important action that can enact immediate relief for people that rely on insulin. And we urge a favorable report. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Michael uh, Zilberman. Good afternoon and thank you Chair Pendergrass and Vice Chair Pina Melnick and members of the committee. I'm here to testify in strong support of HB 1397. For the record, my name is Dr. Mikhail Zilbermint and I'm here testifying on behalf of myself and the views expressed here are my own and do not reflect the policies and positions of Johns Hopkins University or Johns Hopkins Health System. So I'm an associate clinical professor of medicine and chief of endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism at Suburban Hospital in Bethesda. I'm a diabetes expert specializing in the care of hospitalized patients with diabetes. One of my patients um, with insulin dependent type one diabetes ran out of long acting insulin and could not afford to buy more. His insurance policy had a very high deductible. So he tried to stretch out his insulin and ultimately failed. When he was brought to my hospital, he had a life-threatening condition called diabetes ketoacidosis. He was near comatose. He survived that admission to the intensive care unit, but I'm really worried about him and others like him. Remember, insulin is a life-saving medication for millions of people living with diabetes. And for all the people living with type 1 diabetes, insulin is the only option and must be taken every single day of their lives. Even skipping one dose could make this person very ill or even require hospitalization. Over 7 million people in the US use insulin to control their blood sugar. Without it, uncontrolled diabetes can lead to severe life-changing complications such as dialysis, heart attacks, and amputations. I wanna thank you for allowing me to testify in support of HB 1397. I urge a favorable report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Andrew Demidovich. Oops. 
Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Pendergrast, Vice Chair Pena Melnik, and the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of HB 1397. Uh, for the record, my name is Dr. Andrew Davidovich, and I'm here to testify on behalf of myself. Um, the views expressed here on my own did not reflect the policies or positions of Johns Hopkins University or the Johns Hopkins Health System. Um, I apologize in advance if I repeat some of the uh, very poignant uh, facts that the other pres presenters have already presented. Um, I'm an assistant professor of medicine and chief of endocrinology and diabetes here at Howard County General Hospital in Columbia, Maryland. And I've been practiced for 10 years, average about 4,500 patient visits for diabetes a year. And I've published extensively about diabetes and improving care and delivery. And I'm here in strong support of HB 1397. So as we have discussed, one in 10 people in the US have diabetes uh, in the US, which means that if you look around this Zoom room, someone in this very room has diabetes and probably everyone in this room has a colleague, friend or loved one affected by diabetes. Um, in Maryland, over half a million people have diabetes and over 1,500 um, uh, people, sorry, 150,000 people depend on insulin to live. And yet the list price of insulin is nearly tripled in the past 20 years. A Yale study has found that one in four patients ration their insulin, meaning that they will take lower doses or skip doses entirely because of the high cost. And this disproportionately affects the most vulnerable populations, such as racial minorities and disadvantaged people. So from my own experience, when I need to start a patient on long-acting insulin, there's three different manufacturers that make the same exact insulin, but insurance often only covers one of them. But here's the real rub, is that I don't know which one. So if I guess correctly, the patient's insulin might be $30 or even free. But if I guess incorrectly, the patient might have to pay $500 or more for their insulin. It's like a game of three card Monty and uh, more often than not, I lose. So many patients also need insulin, who need insulin require two different types of insulin. So they could actually be looking at $1,000 per month price tag. So I applaud the representatives for putting forth this bill. 10 other states in the US have already passed similar legislation and Maryland should be at the forefront of improving the lives of its citizens. I wanna thank the chairs again and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that anyone may have and a strong uh, favorable report on HB 1397, thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for their testimony. I'll open it now for questions from the committee. Uh, I see Delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as the uh, um, delegated type one diabetic on the committee, I appreciate you letting me ask first. And I appreciate uh, uh, Delegate Penny Melnick bringing this. And I, and I can relate to all these stories that I'm hearing. So I, I know what it's like, but I, I want to bring just a little bit of. Uh, so the rest of the committee understands, and anybody can answer this question, how many units of insulin are in a vial? How many units do the average type one diabetic use per day? And how much is the average cost? I know the cost can go anywhere from $100 to you know $600 for some, but if anybody wants to ask that question, because I want people to understand how much it is per month for some people. Would Dr. Devenovich? Sure. So in a in an insulin pen, it's three hundred dollars, uh, three hundred units per pen. And a box of pens usually contains five pens. So you're normally getting fifteen hundred units per box, and that might run you five hundred dollars. For a vial, it's a thousand units for a single vial. And vials typically are, are cheaper than pens, but they're also more uh, difficult to use and fraught with more potential errors. Because remember, people with diabetes often have eye disease and retinopathy is they have to drop exactly the right number of units. Otherwise they could potentially kill themselves. So, so if I could ask, ask a follow-up. Yes, so, totally Thank you, Madam Chair. And so you said 1,500 units could cost, you know, upwards of $1,500. So 1,500 units, knowing that the average type one diabetic takes anywhere between 50 to 70 units per day. So we're talking about some, some of these type one diabetics could be possibly paying $1,500 just for one month's worth of insulin, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate Lewis. Delegate Lewis. Uh, she seems to have stepped away from her seat for a second. Let me go to Delegate Hill. Maybe she'll come back. Delegate Hill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And once again, um, Madam Vice Chair, another wonderful bill. Can you explain?
Uh, Delegate Hill, you went on mute. I'm sorry, the, I, I was asked? asking, thank you. <laughs> Often, if you could explain um, why this bill seems that it would affect every insurer and so many of the bills that we pass only affect the insurers that insure state employees and other limited numbers. So we often have things that only affect the pricing of a third of the insurers in the state, but this seems like it would be a cap across the board. Can you clarify that that's true and how, how we can do it with this bill? I can take that question. Thank you for that question, Delegate Hill. So actually you're, you're right, this bill would um, affect the one third of uh, the insured. Um, the rest, you know, it wouldn't affect, um, you know, patients on Medicare and Medicaid. So it's, it's really one third of um, commercial products. Um, and where it's going to be most significant is, is for those people who have, who are on insurance plans that have, that have high deductibles um, and don't qualify for Medicaid. So, so yes, I, I want to be clear. It does not affect all the insured. Okay. And if I can have a follow-up, Madam Chair. Yes, delegate. I know a few years ago when we did the bill on diabetic test strips, so there would be no charge for the high deductible plans, we had to do a special amendment that I think we've done on bills since then that um, said that they couldn't charge it, that once the deductible was met, that's when the cap went into effect, but we couldn't affect things before the deductible was met. What I'm wondering is if we need to do the same thing for this bill, and I, I don't know if if I think you're probably the one to answer that too. So we were able to pull the high deductible plans in provided we acknowledged that up until the deductible was met, we couldn't cap it. So what I'll say to that is, um, you know, the other states that I mentioned have capped it regardless um, without such an amendment, um, but that's certainly something we can entertain but I will you know, just leave it at the fact that other states, 15 states have done this. Um, neighboring Virginia, which is where I practice, they cap it at uh, $50. And this legislation is similar, le ca uh, capping legislation is also making way um, to the federal government as well. So that's, that's kind of, that's gonna be my answer to that. Very good, thank you. And Delegate, as we work with the bill, we'll look at the interaction between the, um, not just the high deductible, but the health savings plans uh, that are often related with those issues that you're raising. Delegate Lewis. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, forgive me for stepping away. Thank you to the bill sponsor and panelists. This is a really important bill. I just wanted to mention that um, my mother was one of the one in five Marylanders, African-American Marylanders who died of complications from diabetes in 2018 during session. And she would have really been helped by this bill. She couldn't afford her insulin and my sisters and I didn't know that till it was too late. My question for you, uh, whoever's best poised to answer, um, will this, uh, were, were this bill to pass, uh, would it have any impact on uh, patients, folks who have Medicare Advantage plans? Uh, I've realized um, my good colleague, Delegate Hill mentioned other insurance carriers, but I'm curious about how this would affect Medicare Advantage plan holders, whoever's best to answer. Thank you. Uh, I, I can say something based on my ship counseling, it would not affect Medicare Advantage plans. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your question. Uh, are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, we do have one unfavorable uh, panelist. That would be um, uh, Matthew Celentano. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matt Celentano today here on behalf of the League of Life and Health Insurers of Maryland and AHIP in respectful opposition to House Bill 1397. Uh, we completely understand why this bill is introduced and would never suggest that these life-saving drugs should not be more affordable. But this approach 
will give Big Pharma more free reign to charge carriers whatever they want and increase everyone's premium. Uh, we shouldn't need to cap drug prices. Pharma should just decrease the prices, especially in insulin. The problem is right there. It's the list price that we've heard from many panelists before me. The drug was invented for about $2 100 years ago. The price has skyrocketed to multiple hundreds of dollars a month with not a single bit of new R&D. There is no oversight on the, or control on what the big pharma uh, charge. Simply excessive and unreasonable drug prices have fueled this crisis in our country. The carriers believe that insulin is the poster child for the prescription drug affordability board that you all created a few years ago. There is no drug that highlights the need for a second look on unjustifiable price increases as insulin. And we ask you to request the PDAB, the PDAB take a closer look. That being said, if the policy moves forward, you're going to take out the legs of five of the commercial carriers that have been actively negotiating with the manufacturers to provide their beneficiaries low cost insulin. Three out of the five carriers already have varying deals in place with manufacturers. And if you pass this bill, you will take away the ability of the market to continue to progress without impacting premium. The negotiating leverage will be taken away in an instant. Like I said before, we totally understand why this bill is here and we're completely sympathetic, but we are worried about the impact of the fully insured market, which is only 18% of Maryland in this bill and giving big pharma a further incentive to unjustifi unjustifiably increase prices more. And we respectfully request an unfavorable report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, questions for Matt, uh, Delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Matt, you know, there's no bigger champion of, of the free market than me. And I understand what you're saying. I guess my question for you really is, I mean, the insurers really have the power. We can we can put a board together. It doesn't mean they're going to lower the cost of this drug. And, and we under we understand what the problem is. Do you have another solution that you think the insurance companies should be pushing back on big pharma in a way that could, could reduce? the cost of some of these drugs that you and I agree is about $2 to produce. Yeah. Well, Delegate Chisholm, that's, that's a, that's a great question. And I would um, suggest that maybe we ne need to give the PDAB more, more teeth. We should also get big pharma to come to the table and explain some of these price hikes because they never do. They're never in these hearings. They never come to subcommittee. They hide. And it's time for them to come and explain to us why they took a $2 drug and increase it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars and why they prevent generics from coming to the market. So we didn't, we wouldn't have to have these hearings. And I suggest unless we get the manufacturers to come and have an honest conversation about their list prices, we're never going to make that much progress. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, uh, to the unfavorable panel. Um, I'm curious, uh, and I think Delegate Chisholm asked an excellent question. Um, I'm curious when you say, just to follow up, I'm curious when you say to give the pharmacy uh, board that we created more teeth, what would that look like? Are you offering an amendment? Uh, Delegate Lewis, thank you for the question. I think that there are various ways in which the Prescription Drug Affordability Board could increase their sort of charge. Um, as you might, as you remember from the discussions that they gave them the opportunity down the road to have an upper payment limit. Um, upper payment limits are, I think, appropriate for insulin, especially. especially all knowing that there are only three manufacturers making the drug, there's no generic and we've made no progress because Big Pharma just keeps increasing the price with no justification. If we don't get to the root of that problem and have unjustifiable list prices, we're never going to make progress. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice, uh, Vice Chair Pena Melnick. Thank you, Chairman. So I have a question um, for Mr. Chantilano. What is the percentage of the prescription drug spent on insulin by insurers in Maryland? Delegate Penny Melnick, I do not know that off the top of my head. I can try to figure that out. I just know that this particular approach isn't going to spike prescription drug spend, if that's what you're looking for, in a significant fashion where it's going to tear down the entire insurance market. I will say that uh, bills like these and other uh, bills are have a cumulative effect on premium. And about 10, 15 years ago, the percentage of your premium in Maryland on prescription drugs was about 10%. Um, it's now over a third, and that's because of our 
uh, I think, um, inability to get a handle on pharma's list prices. So if I may, um, Madam Chairman, just a quick follow up. Yes, um, so since you say what I was trying to get at, I'm not, that wasn't what I was trying to get at. What I was trying to get at is that um, insulin makes up such a small percentage of the overall spend that it most likely would not have a huge impact on premiums. In addition, two other carriers like the blues, which are the largest, they already have a cap and 15 states are doing it. So the sky hasn't fallen. That's what I was getting at. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chair. I appreciate that. One other segment we haven't discussed in this bill is that if the uh, drug manufacturers raise the prices, like we we know they will, even if it's if it's not significant, if there is a, a raise in the in the list price, which we expect, what does impact does this have on the uninsured? And those uninsured are not going to be able to have copay caps. They're going to be on their own, and they're going to bear the brunt of the price increases. Okay. Uh, we're going to move to Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And the question is also for Matt. Matt, the state, the state has invested a lot of money in the reinsurance program. And while we have gotten a lot more folks, younger folks, signed up for insurance, is this not helping spread the cost across the board? Wasn't that the whole reason for the reinsurance program? And doesn't that help? The, the impactfulness of drugs like insulin to spread it across healthier folks' uh, premiums? Uh, Delegate Johnson, I'm not sure how to exactly answer that question. Uh, I think that you, you do make a point uh, that we would agree with that spreading the cost out of the entire market does make sense. But in the reinsurance bill, uh, situation, the reason we brought that bill is to make sure that the market didn't implode. Um, and we were in a whole different position than we are now at the stable marketplace. I think that the tension between uh, prescription drug prices and the impact on premium is sort of a different discussion, but something that is going to continue to be problematic if we're talking about affordability because of the percentage of premium that keeps going up and up and up due to the cost of prescription drugs. A follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so. You mentioned before about uh, capping the ceiling on drug costs. Uh, would you then be okay with setting standard copays? Uh, I don't think that's appropriate, Delegate Johnson, because some of these drugs are wildly different in cost. You will have some, you know, penicillin type stuff, which are extremely cheap and have been spread out. And there's multiple generics. There's also drugs that carriers cover that are brand name drugs only. It could be seventy thousand dollars a dose. So I think it's inappropriate to cap particular drugs on a flat sort of plane. Well, let's stick with the insulin then. Well, Maryland already has a cap, Delegate Johnson. It's $150 on, on insulin that you guys passed in 2017, I believe. Okay. All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate Belcastro. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is just really simple for Mr. Celentano. Um, I'm just looking in the committee testimony and I just noticed that there is no written testimony. Would you be willing to submit written testimony to the committee today? I can put together testimony if you would like it, Delegate Belcastro. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on 1397. I appreciate the time and testimony of all the panelists. And we will move to House Bill 1438. This is Delegate Johnson, uh, State Emergency Medical Services Board, Park Services Associates, certification as emergency medical responders. Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the Health and Government Operations Committee. I'm Delegate Johnson here to present House Bill 1438. And you guys can just hang with me today because I'm going to throw some acronyms at you. So just, uh, they're not real hard ones, but hang on. <laughs> House Bill 1438 is an emergency bill providing the Department of Natural Resources, DNR, Park Service Associates, PSAs, temporary status as emergency medical responders, EMRs, through December 2024. Park Ranger serve Associates required coursework already, including EMR training. However, due to a technicality in recognizing PSAs are a separate employment classification from park rangers, 
they have been denied EMR testing and licensing by the State Emergency Medical Service Board. Maryland averaged 2,603 COVID patients per day in January 2022, 48% higher than any other month during the pandemic. At the same time, we saw an increase in staffing shortages in hospitals, intensive care, and emergency departments, reminding us that two years into the pandemic, we need to make better use of our medical professional resources. The state recent response in January 2022 was to mobilize 1,000 National Guard members to assist state and local health officers at coronavirus, uh, coronavirus testing and vaccination sites and staffing at overwhelmed hospitals shortly afterwards. Uh, shortly afterwards, two new executive orders were signed. One, to increase the number of medical professionals by loosening restrictions on medical licensing regulations. The second was to bolster the emergency, uh, get tongue tied, the emergency medical system workforce. The justification from go the governor was, while we can't manufacture doctors and nurses who don't exist, we have to continue to do everything we possibly can do at the state level to help our hospitals withstand this surge and save lives. And yet we continue to bench upwards of 150 trained state employees from participating because of a technical misinterpretation. DNR currently employs PSAs, Park Service Supervisors, PSS, and Park Service Managers, PSM, all of whom are required to complete the American Red Cross EMR training. Of those 150 civilian Park Service employees, seven are also licensed EMTs, and one is also a licensed paramedic. However, none of them are allowed to use these life-saving skills and licenses when working at their DNR Park Service job. The misunderstanding stems from a section of current law that excludes several professions, including law enforcement, from EMR licensing. To date, the board has chosen to exclude PSAs from licensure by viewing them as law enforcement. However, since 2005, PSAs have had separate employment classifications from park rangers, the law enforcement branch of Maryland Park Service. The letter from the Office of the Attorney General that was circulated today, hopefully you got that in your packet, if not, I can get you a copy, clarifies on page two, there is no evidence that an individual's role as a PSA provides recognized status as law enforcement officer under state law, nor does an individual's role as a PSA appear to qualify that individual as law enforcement officer who may be exempt from emergency medical services provided under ED 13-512B2. House Bill 1438 not only immediately adds 150 trained EMRs to Maryland's medical resources, it puts PSAs on the path for permanent EMR licensure from the board. And with the recommended amendments that were added to the bill, the PSSs and PSMs also. Over the next two years, House Bill 1438 requires the board to review all civilian park service documentation and provide opportunities for testing towards EMR licensure. The goal is for all PSAs, PSSs, and PSMs with documented training to be granted emergency EMR status and allow, to, allow them to complete the board EMR training by December, 2024. I ask that you vote favorably on House Bill 1438 to correct this misinterpretation and demonstrate that Maryland is willing to use all available resources to save lives in this pandemic or any other state emergency. Thank you. And I'll refer you to the rest of my panel. Thank you, delegate. And uh, government agencies are certainly famous for our alphabet soup. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying it for us. Um, I'll first go to Christopher Zara, please. Mr. Zara? Hi, can you hear me? 
There we go. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. I didn't know if I had audio or not. Um, first of all, I want to say hello to all the committee members and thank you for hearing my testimony. Um, my name is Chris Sar. I've been a park ranger at Patapsco Valley State Park for the past 20 years. I'm also a uh, labor management committee chairperson for Maryland Park Service. Um, hopefully the committee members got some of the written testimony written by other rangers who wanted to attend and do oral testimony, but could not, uh, as we've already talked about probably in other committees, but, uh, we were very short staffed. So, uh, time, unfortunately this can't take, couldn't take the time out to do this. Um, I basically wanted to, uh, just emphasize that this bill is a corrective that should have occurred uh, when the LEO Rangers transitioned over to NRP uh, about 15 years ago. And when the civilian Rangers filled into place, this never really got fully addressed. Um, LEO Rangers at that time are now currently natural resource police or they are managers in the Maryland Park Service. And the Maryland Rangers and other DNR staff that work in the park have already been receiving certification as emergency medical responders by the American Red Cross. So this bill would simply put us in alignment with the other recognized Maryland uh, state first responders. Um, the bill is not going to change our duties. We're gonna be doing the exact same duties in terms of responding to emergency medical situations as before, uh, nor it's going to change the operating costs for DNR. We're doing the exact same tasks. This is just, uh, We've already been receiving this training. It's part of our mandatory training. Uh, passing this bill would also ensure, as the senator mentioned, that we would have at least 100 first responders at the ready to deal with any state emergencies. And as we've learned from COVID-19 pandemic, these emergencies can strike us at any time and go on for durations we can't foresee. Um, I also heard that there was some expression of dissent from DNR about the bill saying that it's not necessary. Uh, since we're already required to take the first responder course through uh, Red Cross, um, this is a, kind of a contradictory concern. Uh, the Maryland Park Rangers Mr. and other Zara, staff I'm members. Gonna, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up, please. Okay. I'm, basically, we're, we're basically we respond to medical hazardous material and other similar emergencies, and I just asked the committee to support the bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jerry Smith, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jerry Smith. I am the president of the Maryland Professional Employees Council, AFT Local 6197, representing over 5,000 professional employees for the state of Maryland. I'm also a full-time state employee of 35 years with the Maryland Department of Transportation, State Highway Administration, working as a transportation engineer. We ask for favorable report on HB 1438. The Department of Natural Resources, Park Service Associates, PSAs, commonly known as park rangers, have the necessary knowledge and skills to provide immediate life-saving interventions while awaiting additional EMS resources. As certified Red Cross emergency responders, PSAs provide a range of emergency services such as CPR, first aid, emergency medical search and rescue, and wildland fire response. They are the frontline workers in Maryland State Parks who usually first on the scenes when incidents occur. They are dedicated trained professionals who put themselves at risk to serve Maryland, but are unjustifiably denied the proper recognition and benefits they deserve. Two years into the pandemic, we are reminded of the importance of better using our resources. This bill immediately adds trained EMRs to Maryland's medical resources and provide the park rangers the recognition and benefits they deserve. For this reason, we urge you to move favorably on HB 1438. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Um, that concludes the favorable panel. Uh, i open it for questions for the, from the committee. Any questions? Okay. Um, then there are no presentations, uh, no unfavorable presentations. So that concludes the hearing on 1438. Thank you to the panelists and Delegate Johnson. And we will move to House Bill 319. Um, this, uh, this is um, Delegate 
Jones and it's General Provisions Commemorative Days Overdose Awareness. Delgate Jones, welcome to HTO. And you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Delegate Rachel Jones, uh, representing District 27B, Calvert and Prince George's counties. This legislation would allow August 31st to be proclaimed Overdose Awareness Day annually. Opioid addiction is a chronic disease recognized by both the CDC and Prevention and World Health Organization as a fast growing epidemic that can easily lead to overdose and death. Recognizing Overdose Awareness Day in Maryland sends a strong message to former and current substance abusers that they are valued and that those overdose deaths are preventable. In Calvert County, the number of overdose fatalities decreased actually by 20% between 2019 and 2020. In Prince George's County, however, the number increased from 102 opioid overdose deaths in 2019 to 158 in 2020. It's a 54.9 percent increase, and we don't have the numbers from 2020 yet. 2021 yet. That makes it the fourth largest jurisdiction um, in the number of overdoses out of um, all the other counties. Between 2019 and 2020, the number of opioid-related overdose fatalities increased from 2,106 to 2,499. Opioid-related deaths increased the most among people over the age of 55, whereas it had previously been women between the ages of 20 and, and 35 or so. However, overdoses involving males remain consistent across 2019 and 2020 at 72.6%. As the vice president of the board of organization, excuse me, of the board of directors for the nonprofit Farming for Hunger, I've seen firsthand loved ones who have come to volunteer at the farm who hang a photo of their lost loved ones who died due to opioid overdose on the wall of no return, we call it. They mourn, they give back to the community, they give their time in honor of those that they've lost. Raising awareness and breaking down the stigma is a small step in the right direction, um, but there are many, many steps necessary uh, to minimize this crisis. Um, but this is one small step that we can take to make sure that people across the state are aware uh, of the magnitude of this crisis. And I ask for a favorable vote on HB 319. Thank you. Thank you very much, Delegate. Um, would you like to um, cede the rest of your time to any um, individual on your panel or spread it out? I'll cede it to Sandy. Okay. Uh, Sandy Mattingly then, please. You have uh, the delegates remaining time and your two minutes. Thank you, Delegate Jones. Good afternoon. My name is Sandy Mattingly and I'm here today to represent the thousands of Maryland families and individuals who have been impacted by addiction and overdose. Whether they struggle with an addiction, live with a loved one struggling or have lost a loved one to a drug induced death, their lives matter. My son, Chase Mattingly, was only 21 years old four years ago, and he made a horrible mistake, a misled choice to use a drug that caused his death. He was not in addiction. He was healthy, happy, and had a bright future. He died from fentanyl intoxication. He didn't intend to die, and at that time, I, the parent, had no idea what fentanyl was. His life mattered, too. International Overdose Awareness Day is a global event held on August 31st each year and aims to raise awareness of drug overdose, reduce the stigma of substance use, and acknowledge the grief of families and friends who have lost loved ones. The tragedy of addiction, overdose, and overdose death is unacceptable. Overdose does not discriminate and is preventable. The stigma, the shame, and the denial of this epidemic continues to reach epic proportions as we see many more of our young people dying unintentionally due to substance misuse and addiction. This is a mental health crisis and we must act. To help reduce this stigma, I ask each and every one of you to think about the value of your life and that of your loved ones. We need to step up and require our governor to enact legislation to annually recognize our overdose crisis and lower all flags in memory of our fallen. Lowering our flags on this day would send a much needed public statement and certainly a strong message to our citizens that everyone affected by this crisis is valued. Our governor has the authority under an executive order entitled Protocol for the Maryland State Flag, Section 
use during period of mourning to lower our state flag. A state governor also has the authority to order our national flag to fly half staff and honor any other national day of remembrance if they so choose. Let's join the state of Virginia who passed House Joint Resolution 562 last year and will annually fly all flags on August 31st to show their citizens they are remembered and they are valued. I urge you to vote yes to House Bill 319 to annually commemorate Overdose Awareness Day and fly our flags half staff. The governor's office continues to state, and I quote, we are committed to using every tool at our disposal to support individuals battling addiction, their families and communities for a brighter future. What better way to make good on this commitment and show our citizens that their lives really do matter. Let's together, let's get House Bill 319, which has been cross-filed with Senate Bill 100 on the governor's desk this year. Don't wait till it's too late. This effort costs nothing and can help change everything. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manningly. Uh, I'd like to call on Ann Seacott, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ann Seacott testifying on behalf of the Maryland chapter of the National Council uh, on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence in favor of House Bill 319. Um, it, I, it is meaningful to have uh, a day of remembrance, a day of awareness. It provides an opportunity for education, it provides uh, an opportunity for those that have lost loved ones to come together and mourn and, and celebrate the lives lost um, and recommit to uh, being a part of uh, policy changes that are needed, programmatic changes that are needed, the education, the reduction in stigma that is so important uh, to, to help reduce um, uh, drug use, drug uh, overdoses, um, help people get into treatment, help support people in recovery. Um, you know, I think that, that when it comes to the policy tools uh, that exist, uh, and awareness day may not seem that significant, um, but it is. You have had for years now, um, uh, family members come to you talking about their heartbreak um, and having a day that is recognized officially by the state government. Um, it, this is an international day already. Um, let's let's join uh, the rest of the world in recognizing this um, to really help promote some of the positive things that can happen uh, when we all do work together. Um, so with that, we ask for your favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dominic Buchko. He's not here. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, then that concludes the panelists on uh, HB 319. I open it up for questions from the committee. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Delegate Hill. Having a good day today. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank mm -hmm. you, Delegate Jones, for this bill. And um, the question is for you or one of your panelists, if you prefer. Since it's already an international day, um, and that gives opportunity for communities to have events uh, surrounding it to bring awareness to, um, to, to their constituents, et cetera. What do we gain by having it an official Maryland day as well? Sure, thank you for the question, Delgate Hill. Um, most people don't know it's an international day already. I think that's one of the challenges is that um, internationally it's you know designated, but we seldom hear people talk about that. Right, we don't hear people um, telling the stories that honor um, those who are who are gone. And obviously, I, we understand that um, opioid use and, and those who are um, addicted and those who overdose, they're uh, they're struggling. And I think it's very important that we talk about how very easy it is for anyone to fall into that type of addiction. Having a statewide day to recognize that will cause us to ask more questions about who is the average uh, person who's overdosing, right? It's not as people imagined it. I think, um, you know, in the 1980s, certainly I was, you know, just a toddler, but you know, the war on drugs created a stigma of what an addict looks like, right? And I've heard people over the last decade or so, you know, call people junkies and, and things like that. But when you look at the fact that 
a lot of folks, particularly over the last decade, um, are addicted to opioids. Most of them, it resulted because uh, they had a surgery. They were on painkillers for a while, and then the addiction just, you know, sort of ran rampant after that. And so I think that by making it uh, a state uh, holiday, making sure that they're not holiday, but making it a state day to commemorate it makes it so that we as a state, our agencies um, and different parts of our government, we have to acknowledge it. We can't just keep sweeping it under the rug as if these people and their lives didn't matter, that their loved ones and, and what they're trying to do don't matter. Um, particularly in, in Calvert County, I know that several years ago, the school superintendent would say to us, we have a whole generation of kindergartners, kindergartners coming in who have lost parents to, to opioid overdose. So you've got a generation of children who have lost parents, um, young parents. And so we've got to find a way, I think, to make sure that we are highlighting this problem and doing everything that we can. And, and like I said, I think this is just a small step um, in acknowledging it and getting it out in the open because most people don't even know there is an international uh, overdose uh, opioid awareness day. Thank you. Uh, Delegate uh, Landis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delegate Jones, question. So what specific strategies would you put in place to really help bring this thing to light? Because I, I, what you're saying is true. And, you know, the legislation could get passed, but then the question becomes, well, what next? So that's what I'm curious about. Thank you, Delegate Landis. That's a great question. And so the Maryland Department of Health has actually um, had some folks uh, within the agency <laughs> talk to me about some of the concerns around um, opioids and Certainly, I think that they are interested in making sure that we find ways to educate people. And most of our local health departments across the state are doing that. They're trying to um, you know, make posts and, and signage available within the health department, but that only really reaches the folks that are um, you know, coming in for services on a regular basis. I think this would open the door for a more, a more uh, concentrated effort on the uh, part of the Maryland Department of Health to be able to find ways to reach perhaps high school students or college students. We need to find a way that we can talk to people and educate them about the dangers of opioid addiction and how very easily you know one could become addicted to prescription um, drugs, which then leads to um, you know heavier, uh, obviously types of um, drugs. And so I think that um, it just starts the conversation and really the possibilities are endless for what we can do. Um, but I think that it obviously gives the Maryland Department of Health a good framework for how we can be begin um, to spread the message. And it also gives um, all of our state agencies and, and even our school system, right? That, like I said, the Maryland Department of Education and our community colleges and our universities at large, if there's a day that is recognized statewide, then I'd like to think that every single agency and stakeholder across this state would take an interest and take the time to find a way um, to highlight this. And I think it just creates more conversations across the state and has more people looking for uh, solutions or ways that they can be helpful or ways that they can just uplift the people in their community who may be struggling. It also helps employers in the workforce. Um, throughout the years, I've seen different um, sort of chamber of commerces or um, regional um, workforce alliances try to find ways to talk to their employers about what they can be looking for um, among their employees, there are different signs that behavioral health special, specialists can tell you to look for that might, that maybe you didn't notice before, but um, if you were trained, you might be able to notice an employee who's an addict that may be just functioning very, very well um, during the work hours and then goes home and, you know, um, abuses opioids. And so it, it creates just uh, limitless, I feel, conversations and possibilities and discussions that would be helpful in reducing um, reducing our overdose deaths and um, reducing the stigma. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Any further questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, that completes the hearing on House Bill 319. Thank you, Delegate and your panelists for coming to testify today. We will move to House Bill 987. This is Delegate Walker. 
um, general provisions, sickle cell anemia awareness month. Delegate Walker, welcome to HGO this year. Good to see you on HGO. Uh, good to see so many of my colleagues from over the years and haven't been here in a while, but it's always good to oh. be in front of you all. Uh, thank you for the hard work that you all do in keeping Maryland as, as healthy as possible. Uh, well, I'd like to start off by saying on 987, first thing I want to do is, uh, if, we, if you all do take the bill, is change the title. Well, I'd like to strike the word anemia uh, from the bill. So it would be Sickle Cell Awareness Month. Uh, in doing so, in doing some more research on this one, they kind of don't like to have the word anemia associated with it because it causes a stigma. And that's part of the reason why this bill is in front of you. Uh, what this bill does, it, it would make, uh, in language in Annapolis, we'd say it almost codify existing language to codify what we do, like with tax policy, and we try to codify it with the federal government. Well, the federal government has already acknowledged that September is Sickle Cell Awareness Month. And I'd like to do the same thing here in the state of Maryland by saying that Sickle Cell should be Awareness Month should be in the month of September. Uh, the governor should annually do this. Now, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because we want to focus the attention and the needed research and treatment of sickle cell disease. Now, sickle cell is a red blood cell disorder. It's an inherited disease. That means that it's passed down uh, from the way you would get the eye color, uh, your skin color, uh, the hair from your parents. Uh, for a child to inherit sickle cell, both parents need to carry the gene for it. There's no way that you catch sickle cell and it's not contagious, you're born with it. I'm not gonna go into describing sickle cell, going into the details with the HGO committee, because I know you all know so much more about it. And how ironic is this? that the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America is located where? Here in Maryland. So what I'm asking for us to do is to go along with the federal government, do the right thing and bring awareness and focus attention on sickle cell. Uh, many of us know people that have been affected by this disease. And I believe that if we educate the population on this one, we can remove some of the stigmas that go along with having the trait. That being said, I ask for a favorable review. Thank you, Delegate. Um, Delhi, would you like to uh, cede the rest of your time to your panelist, Derek Robertson? Absolutely. Okay, Mr. Robertson, you have the delegate's time um, plus your own two minutes should you need it. Thank you, Chair Collison. Thank you, um, Chair Prendergrass, and thank you to um, Vice Chair Penny Melnick for your you know tireless efforts with sickle cell disease. Um, it's also good to see you, Delegate Hill. I know you've worked with us many times. And thank you so much, uh, Delegate Walker, not just for ceding me the time, but also for your longstanding support of sickle cell disease. You may not remember when I met you first back in about 2013, and this bill was actually, I believe, introduced originally in 2012. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Derek Robertson. And I am the president and co-founder, along with my wife, Shante, of the Maryland Sickle Cell Disease Association. We have three sons, and two of them have sickle cell disease. And the Maryland Sickle Cell Disease Association is in support of HB 987. The Maryland Sickle Cell Disease Association tagline is Awareness, Knowledge, Cure. And we did that because we firmly believe that awareness is where things start. As you build awareness, you develop more knowledge and eventually that will lead to a cure. And that's precisely what this bill will do. It will raise awareness about sickle cell disease. Just last week, this committee heard several bills on sickle cell disease and uh, increased awareness could have been helpful in that setting. For example, to distinguish between newborn screening, which is done at birth, as opposed to transcranial Doppler screening, which is a uh, diagnostic test looking to screen for stroke after birth. And, and there was some discussion about that. Um, we have seen how a dedicated month can improve awareness about the disease. We need to no, look no further at October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, you know, when I was growing up, you didn't say that word. Um, and so now you have football players wearing pink socks. Uh, and so I think that that's a testament to the level of awareness that you get from uh, something like a, a specific month. Um, yeah. Delegate Walker was um, exactly correct where we do have a federal designation, but just as De Delegate Jones mentioned about the Opioid um, Awareness Day, um, the same thing applies. It would be very appropriate to have it here in Maryland to bring a focus to Maryland and some of the needs of the, the patients in Maryland. And that's precisely why 
we are um, working so hard with Delegate Penya Melnick, with Delegate Hill and with others, with Delegate Patterson, who's on the call, and Delegate McComas, to try and get awareness and work around sickle cell disease. Um, and it's for all of these reasons that we urge a favorable report um, on using this bill, using Sickle Cell Awareness Month as a catalyst for increasing awareness about sickle cell disease because that will lead to increased resources and increased resources will lead to increased services, which will lead to increased better outcomes for individuals living with sickle cell disease. I thank you so much um, for your time and hearing this bill and thank you again, Delegate Walker for uh, introducing it. Well, Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. I will open it up now for questions from the committee. Are there questions from the committee? Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Delegate, for bringing us this legislation. I went to a sickle cell community event this summer in the park in Aberdeen, and um, it, a lot of people showed up. They were asking questions, reading a lot about it, getting a lot of information. Uh, is that what you envision this bill to do is for people to uh, raise the awareness and start asking questions and get educated more on the sickle cell disease? Absolutely. I think, you know, kind of goes, it used to be considered like taboo to mention sickle cell having an affliction with it there. So by having the awareness, I think we can put research behind it as well, as well as, a, you know, funding mechanism. This is something out there that's still ravaging the African-American community in particular that I think we need to pay attention to and address and have more people understand exactly what it is. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Um, any other questions? Okay, seeing no other questions, that concludes the hearing on House Bill 987. Thank you very Thank much, you so Delegate much. Walker and Mr. Robertson for coming to speak to us today. Uh, we will move to House Bill 484. This is Delegate Bondari. General provisions, commemorative days, um, the Shane Day, Delegate Bandari. Thank you, Madam Chair and member of the Health and Government Operations Committee. For the record, uh, this is uh, Delegate Harry Bandari here with House Bill 484. The say is a celebration of good uh, triumphing over evil, which originated in Nepal and is part of many national cultural identities of all Americans who trace their route to Asia. While the festivities usually last for up to two weeks, House Bill 484 seeks to identify just one day, October 5, is the say day uh, in the state of Maryland. This will acknowledge and legitimize an important cultural uh, practice of our South Asian communities and Asian community, helping them feel at home in our state. In recent years, the Nepali diaspora in the United States has grown, and Maryland is one of the main settling points for families immigrating from Nepal and nearby countries. According to the most recent American community survey, the Asian population of Maryland surpasses over 375,000, with South Asian representing the largest uh, proportion. These communities are growing and the immigration from South Asian countries will continue to rise uh, in the coming years. And they're contributing our state almost in every walk of life. I'm grateful to the state for welcoming these communities, uprooting one's cultural and um, culture and making a home in a new country is not easy. Uh, there are many things we can do to bolster our social support for vulnerable people and communities, which would help make it easier for them to get settled and integrate into American life. Recognizing Dashay Day would not solve these bigger problems, but it would send a clear message of welcome, support, and solidarity. While living as a minority in the United States has always had its challenges, a 150% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes and vitriol during the pandemic has forced this community to grapple with anxiety and fear. Both President Biden and Governor Hogan have condemned hate crimes against Asian Americans, but we can go further. We can make a point to be proud of the beauty of our cultural blame. We can help good triumph over evil. It does not cost anything for the state. Recently, I was honored to earn a PhD from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, 
studying the political and linguistic integration uh, of these vulnerable communities. Part of my research included a nationwide survey of these communities and a clear majority of respondents indicated that they do not feel recognized or that they have a voice in political and cultural discourse in this country. This reinforces a sense of separation and creates a loop that prevents these folks from integrating into American society, but they are paying attention. They will receive a clear message from the passage of this bill. They will see the shade recognized by government agencies, businesses, schools, and other organizations. And they will understand that the state of Maryland has taken a stand to say that the shade matters and this community matters in the light that diversity is our strength. My office has forwarded the letter of support from Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus and many nonprofit organizations are in support. Some of them are testifying here. In light of this, I respectfully request a favorable uh, report. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Delegate. Um, Delegate, is there a particular panelist you'd like to see the rest of your time to? Yeah, I would love to um, go next, Deepa. Okay, Gurung. Deepa Gurung? Yes. You have the delegates remaining time and your own two minutes. Hello, hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Deepa? Hello? Good to hear her. Hi, delegates. Um, can you hear me now? Your, 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 Ms. Gowen, your, your volume is extremely low. Okay, this would be those te technical difficulties re we referred to in the beginning of the meeting. Um, perhaps we can come back to you and um, um, see if we can't get your sound adjusted. Delegate Cullison, uh, sometimes if a person turns up the volume on their own computer, it records or it accepts the microphone better. Uh -huh. Madam Chair, how about we go to Supriya and we can come back to her as she's adjusting her mic. Um, yes, we can do that. Supriya uh, Gimire, Gimirte? Gimire, yes, thank Gimire. you. Uh, All right, great. Yeah. Good afternoon, members of the Health and Government Operations Committee. My name is Supriya Gimire. I'm a 17-year-old college freshman currently attending Mount St. Mary's University. I'll be speaking on behalf of the non-resident Nepali Association, and I'm here today to present my testimony regarding House Bill 484, with the agenda to promote South Asian culture and officially declare October 5th as Nase Day. Nase is a holiday commonly celebrated among the Nepali community. The main idea of Nase is to celebrate the victory of good over evil. Being the first state to acknowledge Nase would be a huge leap towards equality. Not only would this be a learning and teaching experience, this would also allow Maryland to be seen as a state who cares about the voice of their minority groups. In a way, you could say that Dasa is the most important holiday in Nepal. To begin, it's the longest holiday and Nepali people from all around the world tend to go back to Nepal during this time in order to celebrate this holiday. This lasts about 15 days and this isn't always the case for everyone as money and legal issues could play a role. Voting in favor of this bill would give recognition to the Nepali community, allowing them to feel welcomed and included. This would also be an opportunity to teach the rest of the country that we represent appreciation for people all around the world. It baffles me to see the lack of knowledge our, our society possesses about my country. The diversity in Maryland is truly astonishing. Seeing the beauty of every culture come together in order to create a community. We as America need to strive to be a country that respects all holidays and accepts the importance of cultures everywhere. We might differ in color, we might differ in race, we might even differ in culture, but with love and acceptance, may we all be united. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Deepa, can we try again? Um, and with you turning up the volume on your computer. Deepa Guru. Madam Chair, we okay. can go to the next week. Okay, let's go to uh, Arya. Acharya, Acharya. Hello. Okay. Am I good to begin? Yes, go ahead. 
Members of the Health and Government Operations Committee, I'm writing as a student from Baltimore County in favor of House Bill 484. My name is Arya Charya, and I'm representing the Baltimore Association of Nepalese in America. I'm a 10th grader who, as a Nepali American, celebrates the holiday Dasai around the fall time. Dasai is a holiday that many Nepali Americans in my community celebrate, but we are often faced with challenges every year while trying to. Dasai is a very special holiday for me and many other students who live in Maryland. We often meet with many different people throughout the day and have specific activities to do. With all the fun that comes with Dasai, I've been school has been scheduled for eight of the nine years that I celebrated during the school year. While doing the important activities on Dasai, I often feel a burden thinking about all of the work that I am missing. And this burden becomes much more prominent as you start to get older and reach higher grade levels, which is what I've noticed. Seeing the school systems not recognize my community and the holidays I celebrate make me feel like my community is neglected and not respecting our traditions has not only affected Dasai, but it's also leaving a negative precedent. It shows a poor reflection on our county and our school system's ability to reach our needs, which I believe is not true and we can do better than this. If this bill is passed, students will not have school on Dasai and not only would this remove the bur that burden, it would also show my community that our school systems actually care. I see many other groups get proper representation, but Nepali residents still don't have need, even though our community is rapidly growing. Maryland has the fifth biggest Nepali population in the U.S., and Baltimore especially has a growing number of Nepali Americans, which is still growing. If we continue to ignore the Nepali population and our needs, young children who celebrate Dasai will never see their culture as something that is recognized. Recognizing this holiday would be the first step and would help students enjoy Dasai the way it was originally intended to be celebrated. For these reasons, I strongly urge you to support House Bill 484. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that great testimony. Uh, let's try Deepa Guru. Hey, Delegate, can you hear me well now? Now we can hear you, yes. Okay, my you. apologies for all the technical difficulties. Again, good af <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon, Madam President, Madam Vice President, and honorable members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to let me testify on how... House Bill 484. My name is Deepa Garung, and I work for Baltimore County Circuit Court as a Judiciary Assignment Clerk. I am so honored and delighted to convey the significant value thus I holds in the poly American citizen like me. Growing up in two different nations, I uh, was often conflicted with the culture both nations hold in such high regard, but I always recognized thus it was the time when we get to celebrate righteousness over evil. Every year, thus it falls on different date, but Having a significant day to recognize the celebration will mean more than anything to all the 200,000 Nepalese who live across the United States. Dase, known as Vijaya Dasami, literally means goddess through this victory over evil. Now think about how many holidays we have where a female goddess is celebrated. Mm -hmm. Today, I would like to point out a different point of view for Dase. Dase marks a symbol of feminism in my life. Goddess Durga is an epitome of prosperity, strength, motherhood, and protection of the universe. Um, and Goddess Durga is the embodiment that protects mankind from evil, misery, destroying evil forces like arrogance, jealousy, prejudice, anger, and selfishness. We need this now more than ever. Victory over evil. In the end, I would like to thank you, Delegate Bandari, for sponsoring this culturally significant bill. And I appreciate everyone for listening. I urge everyone to vote, have a favorable report on this bill. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, there are no other panelists. I will now turn it over for questions from the committee. Questions from the committee. Okay. Not seeing any questions. Madam Chair. Um, oh, do. Yeah, yeah. I would like to um, correct the record of one of uh, the areas. This uh, bill does not mandate the holiday. This is just the proclamation. Uh, okay, just wanted to clarify this, okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you for doing that, Delegate. Um, okay, seeing no questions uh, from the committee, then that concludes the hearing on House Bill 484. I thank the panelists for coming to testify today and Delegate Bandari for the bill. We will move to the next bill, which let me check out the time. Yeah. Uh, the next bill is House Bill 479. This is Delegate Fennell. Thank you. General Provisions Commemorative Days, Tuskegee Airmen Commemoration Day. Uh, Delegate Fennell, welcome to HGO. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, Chairman Pendergrass, Vice Chair, and the distinguished members of Health and Government Operation Committee. Thank you for allowing me to introduce the Tuskegee Airmen Commemoration Day Bill. This bill seeks to establish a statewide day of recognition for their accomplishments, contributions, and total commitment of one of the most legendary facets of our American military history, the Tuskegee Airmen HB 439. Following passage by the committee, the Maryland General Assembly and the signing into the law by the governor will commence the fourth Thursday of March of 2023 and shall continue annually thereafter. The month of March is symbol symbolic indeed and has been designated for this honor as it marks the very month the first black aviator cadets completed their flights training, thus received their wings. HB 439, also upon become, becoming law, looks to meet an anticipated hunger for further knowledge of the Tuskegee Airmen, an American treasure that is forever woven into our fabric of our nation. Surprising to no one, in 1940s, the US military was less than kind to its eye color soldiers, yet faced with seeming odds, both in the air and on the ground, the Tuskegee airmen will not only fly directly into combat, but will also soar into history. Throughout the history, American, African Americans have played a vital role in nearly every major conflict this country has endured. And the contribution of such freedom fighters as Nat Turner, Christmas Actus, Eugene Bellart, and Jesse Coleman, to name a few, all speak to this wise. The Tuskegee Airmen through superior bravery and valor have undoubtedly earned uh -huh, mm -hmm. yes, their place in the hearts of our, of our people worldwide and continue to do so to this day. In similar fashion to Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Joshua Henson and others, many of the Tuskegee Airmen also hailed directly from our great state, giving us Melanders another name to truly to be proud of. In closing, and on behalf of the Tuskegee Airmen, I happily request from the committee a vote of yes for HB 439 for these very reasons laid before you today. So I'm asking the committee for a favor review. Thank you so much. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate, would you like to cede the rest of your time to Mr. Owings? I will, thank you. Okay, Mr. Owings, you have the Delegate's time plus your two minutes. George Owings, please. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Madam Chair. Uh, this is my third visit before the committee on this issue. And you know, when I was in the House, uh, I wanna thank, uh, I want to thank Delegate Jones, who's doing a good job in the seat that I held 17 years, but that's neither here nor there now. For Sandy and uh, and the chair and, and uh, um, let's see, somebody else on the committee would remember those days. With that said, this bill is a commemorative bill, only a commemorative bill. No day off, no paid vacation, nothing more than a day of recognition. You know, there was a time, Madam Chair, when the House hated to see the Senate get in front of us. Twice the Senate has passed this bill, 47 to nothing. It covers all 47 senators, of course. So what uh, Delegate Fidel is asking is that this thing gets out of the House this time and at least goes to the full uh, chamber for a vote. You know, but it was, as she pointed out, uh, a time when racism stopped these very individuals from even entering the war until two years after it started. 43 is when they came into the war and they fought with valor and they, they made a mark and they, uh, they did it well. But let me take it a step farther. There was an individual I sat beside twice before this committee testifying. His name was General Charles McGee, born 102 years ago. Unfortunately, he will not see this come to pass. He died in January of this year. But Senator Van Hollen and our uh, fourth uh, district uh, representative, Anthony J. Brown, uh, sponsored his elevation to general. So, I mean, it doesn't get any closer to home than, than this issue right here. Uh, so I'm really hoping that this year, this bill will come out. And again, I wanna thank uh, Delegate Fennell for putting this in. 
I believe you're going to hear some great testimony from a couple of other individuals uh, who hopefully are signed up uh, to testify. But, you know, it's only appropriate that we simply recognize these people for all that they did. You know, you often wonder what would have happened had they not fought the war that they fought um, and where we would be today. I'm not going to try to come up with what it is. But so far, we've heard two uh, days, uh, overdose day uh, by, uh, by my delegate, Delegate Jones and Delegate Walker. Well, it's interesting that right now, as we speak, this department is holding a subcommittee hearing on, let me get it right, um, combating substance abuse among the veterans and their families. So I have a subcommittee coming out of the Veterans Commission itself as we speak being covered by uh, the Deputy Secretary. Madam Chair, I wanna thank you for the opportunity. And again, Delegate Fennell, thank you very much for putting this forward one more time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Um, so those are the folks who have signed up to speak on this uh, on this bill. So I will now open it for questions from the committee. Are there any questions from the committee? Delegate uh, Sample Hughes. Thank you. I felt like I was in school for a minute. I forgot about the <laughs> virtual hand. I was like, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Um, speaker pro tem, it works. <laughs> oh, so thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, Delegate, for this bill. And the uh, reason that I guess it comes to pass is just, it's just like what Secretary Owens has said, that the men have given so much. And we had, you know, Marylanders that have benefited from it. So um, what is beneficial also in the state of Maryland that we have a strong aviation program um, at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Certainly, I believe that this, and I hope you would agree, um, would also be a opportunity to show forth um, those students that are enrolled in that program. Would you agree, uh, Delegate Fennell? Absolutely, absolutely. It would be it'd be a great benefit. Yes, and maybe there could be a connection if this bill were to pass. Exactly. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, delegate. I appreciate that. Seeing no further questions from the committee, that concludes the hearing on House Bill four seven nine. Uh, we are going to take a 15 minute break to give ourselves a little bit of time to stretch, uh, perhaps get some nutrition, and we will reconvene at 340. So the committee will reconvene at 340. Thank you.
Okay. I think it tests the sound. Can can we be heard? Yes, you can, can be heard. We can hear you. Hear all of you. I have to go back for voting. Sorry. Okay, we're going to start in 30 seconds. It looks like my committee is so much better than I am at getting back on time. <laughs> so. We know you were just hanging out in the wings, making sure we were here so you wouldn't embarrass us. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> that's, that's right. No, actually, I was on the phone working on a bill, so... <laughs> which is what we are all spending our day on. Um, okay, I uh, would ask that the delegates all come on, come on back to camera, but we will go ahead and get started. Um, and we are going to begin this uh, second half of the HGO committee with House Bill 548. This is Delegate Patterson. General Provisions Commemorative Days, Montford Point Marines Commemoration Day. Uh, Delegate Patterson, welcome to HGO. Delegate, unmute perhaps. Hello? Um, Delegate Patterson, are you there? Can you hear me? Now we can. Oh, you, oh I see. Uh, Carol, uh, hi. Hear? You're going to um, I'm her intern, Delegate. Ivana Ali. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Pendergrass, Vice Chairman Penna Melnick, and Health and Government Operations Committee members. For the record, um, I'm Ivana Ali, her intern, presenting HB 548, a proposal to create the Montfort Point um, commemoration day in Maryland, the Montfort Point Marines were the first African-Americans who enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps following the establishment of the Fair Employment Practices Commission in 1941. Although we know about the Tuskegee Airmen and Buffalo Soldiers, most civilians and even many of in the military do not know of the struggles, distinctions, and courage of the Montfort Point Marines. Established in 1942 as a separate, segrega separate, separate segregated training facility for African-American servicemen, the facility was built in a swampy, wildlife-ridden forest area deprived of comparable facilities as their white counterparts. Withstanding the unimaginable harsh hardships and racism, the Montfort Point Marines took part in three major wars and several smaller conflicts while dealing with the discrimination within the Corps and worldwide. In 1948, President Harry Truman signed Executive Order 9981, which moved to abandon segregation segregation as a federal policy and required de desegregation on the entire military. 
This action led to the deactivation of Montford Point as a training facility. However, Montford Point Marines were important in all major campaigns of World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, and helped spread liberty and end the political disruption around the world. For the reasons cited, I'm requesting a favorable report for HB 548. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am gonna call on Lawrence Abel, please. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. We're very pleased to be here. My name is Lawrence Abel, and I'm president of the Maryland Veterans Museum, uh, 1000 Crane Highway at Newburgh, Maryland. And uh, the museum uh, presents the story of America, mostly veterans from the very beginning, 1776 to the present day. And I'm hoping that it stops in the Middle East and we don't have to worry about Ukraine. Um, at our regular meeting of April 8th, uh, the Board of Directors, on behalf of the members, unanimously voted to support this bill, uh, uh, 548. Um, uh, the question is why? And uh, the museum has gone through a self-evaluation starting about three years ago, and we are, have been a rapidly developing museum, so we went back to look at all of our um, exhibits and so forth. And we found that we had not done everything we, we could to um, display the role of African-Americans, Native Americans, women and children in the museum. So we uh, went upon an effort to try to uh, correct that. And so we have done extensive research and in particular, we've tried to tell the stories of black history which has really been overlooked and forgotten and probably not available for the most part because it's not in the textbooks. And so we have uh, worked very, very hard to uh, correct this and we have developed many, many stories in the museum now. For example, uh, in the American Revolution, uh, many don't realize that slaves were gi uh, given freedom to fight and they fought in the Maryland First Regiment, uh, the Rhode Island First Regiment. And so they went from the farm field to the battlefield to fight. And very valiantly, they fought. Mr. And, Abel, Mr. Yeah. Abel, hold on just a second. Susanna, would you please give Mr. Abel uh, the remainder of the um, sponsor's time? Thank you. Mr. Abel, go ahead. So George Washington brought the uh, Rhode Island First Regiment a black regiment to Yorktown to fight and fought in one of the key battles. And uh, as a result of their effort, that is why we um, are, have our independence from Great Britain to today. The story of the Montford uh, Marine Camp is um, no less compelling. It's a wonderful story. 170 years later, the same type of situation, we had to re rely on our black soldiers to come forth and pre uh, perform in World War II. So we simply ask you to support this bill. And uh, we also, uh, I would just simply note that the Tuskegee Airmen was just up and we support the Tuskegee Airmen, the, uh, the Triple Nickel, the Buffalo Soldiers, and many other African-American efforts. Uh, anything that we can do to support this uh, effort of showing the, the black Americans and what they've done for America is very, very important. Someday, I hope we can have a black veterans commemoration day that all of these stories can be told. But in the meantime, we'll take the passage of this bill as a significant story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abel. That completes the favorable panel. Uh, I will open it up for questions from the committee, please. Any questions from the committee? Seeing no questions, uh, thank, I guess we did a thorough job. Uh, that concludes the hearing on House Bill 548. Uh, I wanna thank um, uh, Delegate Patterson's intern, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, and uh, Mr. Abel for testifying. And we will move to the next bill, which is House Bill 1166. This is Delegate McComas. State designation, state song, come home to Maryland. Delegate McComas, welcome to HGO. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, your advice on this bill uh, before it was fired. Fired no, before it was filed. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Hopefully, you will be able to hear um, hear the song uh, electronically. Um, HB 1166 introduces the original song "Come Home to Maryland," written by David Hooper, a lifelong resident of our great state of Maryland and a current Harford County denizen. Its lyrics reminds us of Maryland's beauty, diversity of people and places, and its history sometimes bloodied by the sacrifices of Marylanders past in the name of freedoms we hold so dear. Come Home to Maryland, written as a legacy to the late Senator Bob Hooper, evokes fond memories of the time spent on the Chesapeake Bay, crabbing, fishing, or just taking in the rays on a boat or beach. The song reminds us that the land of pleasant living is nothing short of little America. Its lyrics hearkens to our beautiful glistening beaches, timbered mountains, bustling cities, lush farmland, teeming waters, and rich historical heritage going back to the earliest of recorded history of the original 13 colonies. Written and played from the heart, Come Home to Maryland is a warm and welcoming reminder of what makes Maryland the place to call home. Please consider a favorable vote for Come Home to Maryland as our new state song. With that, any remaining time, I would like to hand over to Mr. David uh, Hooper, who is the um, writer of the song. Okay, Mr. Hooper. You have the delegates time plus two minutes of your own. Uh, Mr. Hooper, we cannot hear you very well. Perhaps if you turn the volume up on your computer. I think Delegate McComas just went to help. Okay. We are. Oh, come over this side too. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Get, get, oh, and then he get, needs to open here. I had Darlin, can you can you help him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We got we we now hear we're coming we have oh. audio okay uh hey, we're trying to get this picture too <laughs> yeah i'm okay. glad to there's the picture there we go okay let's see if we can get him unmuted here can you, it, whoops can you there hear you us go. here delegate yes I yes can i can you. here we go i'm turning it over to mr hooper thank you welcome mr hooper thank you to the committee for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the song I come to you in Maryland, bred and born. Our family has lived in Maryland going back at least as far as the mid 1800s. Here was I born, here shall I die. I've lived here all my entire life, except the two years when I was drafted into the army, including the year in Vietnam. And while I was in Nam, my chief desire was to come home to Maryland. As to the song, I've been to most all of these places, and the song has been played in venues all around Maryland. The main reason for submitting the song, I love this state, and I want to honor this state. And also to honor my family, I want to honor my brother, Senator Bob Hooper, who's served in this legislature until the cancer took him. I think of him every day and I miss him every day. And to honor our kids. Our kids were educated here and got a really good Maryland education. Our daughter Chanel now delivers mail in Bel Air. Our son Yuri graduated first in his class at Bel Air High, first in his class at Salisbury University. Then went to work immediately at the tuberculosis lab of the Maryland Department of Health. Our daughter Diana graduated top 10 in her class at Bel Air High, was salutatorian of her class at the University of Baltimore. She's now the lead fiscal clerk at the District Court of Maryland for Hartford County. And she's also the accounting area specialist for Cecil County, Kent County, Talbot County, Caroline County, and Queen Anne's County. Educated in Maryland, serving and working in Maryland. And I wanna thank you again for your kind attention and your consideration. And 
for giving me the opportunity to maybe honor our state. Come home to Maryland. Madam Chair, is there any way you, you can play it? Because I, I don't have it on, I'm not on the committee and I know we, we got the disc down to your to your committee. And I, I don't know if you want to play um, it for the committee or. Susanna, do you have, or, or Richard, do you have it? Yeah, I, can I we have pay, the track here and I can play it for everyone. Can we play like a minute of it? A minute or so of it? Yes, ma'am. Give me one okay. second. Okay. Richard, is it can it be done? Okay. Come home to Maryland, land that I love. Waves across the ocean. excitement on the streets of Baltimore walking peaceful country roads down on the eastern shore Antietam oh Antietam what a grim and mournful day oh, brother Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Mr. Hooper. Um, I think we have a flavor of it, and I'm wondering, Richard, if, if any of the delegates want to hear the whole thing, that if you can share the track. Um, but yeah. now I'm going to open it to questions from the committee. Any questions? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you very much, delegate, for bringing us the bill and the song, Mr. Hooper. Uh, that concludes the hearing on 1166, and we'll move to House Bill um, 238, Delegate Resnick, State Designation, State Spirit, uh, Marilyn Rye, and uh, Delegate Resnick, are you presenting or are you asking for someone else to present? I'm going to present for uh, just a minute or two. Uh, my witnesses were had a glitch with the system and were not able to sign up. So if I could see from time to one individual afterwards, I would appreciate it. Okay, I can, I can allow that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to HGO. Um, I come with you with a bill and yet another way for me to say never say never in the Maryland legislature. Um, I am here presenting uh, a state symbol bill for the state spirit, uh, which is Maryland rye whiskey. I'm, I'm presenting this bill for a very specific reason. This is a real economic opportunity for the state. Maryland whiskey is a, um, is, is a known commodity. It is a, has a history of hundreds of years of being distilled here in the state. It is a very unique product. Um, and it is something that is actually now being sold by distillers in other states. Um, Pikesville Maryland rye whiskey is being produced in Kentucky. Uh, Gunpowder rye Maryland rye whiskey is being produced in Maine. Leopold Brothers rye Maryland rye whiskey is being produced in Colorado. This is a known product and it is something that is being produced by the majority of our 33 distilleries here in Maryland currently. Um, even the, the very famous uh, bourbon distiller, Basil Hayden out of Kentucky, started his career as a, as a Maryland rye whiskey distiller before in the 1800s, Kentucky lured him away with, um, with corn subsidies. Uh, this is a known product. It is something that can help boost our economy through uh, the sale of the product through tourism. Uh, the Maryland Distillers Guild is currently in the process of establishing a distiller's passport that can bring people to the state the way the Kentucky Bourbon Trail brings people to Kentucky. And there's also an agricultural boon and can help um, 
Maryland farmers who are growing rye uh, with the opportunity to produce more product. And I will say rye is a, a difficult crop to grow. And if we are encouraging uh, Maryland farmers to do it, um, this will help them to, uh, to, to be a boon. So this is actually a really great opportunity for the state. I think we need to take the opportunity to, to, um, to brand this product um, and to move forward uh, united with all of our distilleries as a state. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Mr. Brian Tracy from Sagamore, um, who can who can do uh, two minutes as well. Thank you, Delegate. Mr. Tracy, you have the remainder of the delegates' time. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everybody, for your time. And especially thank you, uh, Delegate Resnick, for bringing this to our attention. Um, I'm going to probably repeat a fair amount of what you said, but I, I think I'm just so proud of the history that we have here in the state of Maryland. And I truly believe that we have a amazing opportunity on our doorstep by moving forward and, and claiming this as our state spirit. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we have a distilling history that goes back to the 1500s, 1600s. You know, you fast forward, even in 1910, Maryland had 44 licensed distilleries all making rye whiskey, 22 in downtown Baltimore. Um, 1936, you know, we kept distilling actually through prohibition. It's one of the reasons they say Maryland's called the free state. And in 1936, Maryland held 110 million gallons of rye whiskey, one third of the nation's supply. And the term Maryland rye whiskey was actually denoted and associated as a term as the superior rye whiskey. And I'd love to read you just a quote from the Baltimore Sun in 1923. Um, it talks about $200,000 worth of whiskey being brought down from um, Cockeysville and the Sherwood Distillery to Pier 6 in the Inner Harbor to be exported to England and Scotland. And it talks about um, to throw the hijackers off their guard, tell them the liquor was coming from Kentucky because Maryland whiskey was considered superior than to, uh, to even the Kentucky whiskey. So we have a great opportunity. We know Maryland um, was really considered the best. Uh, we have famous distilling roots, as we mentioned, the Bean family started here. Uh, there's a huge economic opportunity. We know others are trying to cash in, Pennsylvania, Colorado, New England, so forth. Our neighbors to the north or south, Pennsylvania or Virginia are going to try and claim this. We need to get this while we can. Maryland is the birthplace of rye whiskey, the original American whiskey. We need to claim what's ours. It's going to be huge economic impact. Kentucky does almost $9 billion a year just in tourism activity. And it's because people think the only place in the world you can make bourbon is Kentucky. And that's wrong. But we need to claim rye whiskey. There's only two American rye. The two American whiskeys being made, bourbon, and Kentucky's already claimed it, and rye. And we have a great opportunity here. It's a birthplace. Let's bring it home. It's great for jobs, restaurants, hotels, agriculture. And for this reason, I please ask people to vote favor favorably at House Bill 238. It's a great opportunity for our state. Thank you, Mr. Tracy. Don't forget Rob Roy's, too. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that uh, completes the uh, panel for HB 238. I open it up for questions. Questions from the committee? Any questions? Seeing none, that completes the hearing on House Bill 238. Thank you, Delegate Resnick and Mr. Tracy for filling us in. Um, and we will move to the next bill, the final bill of the day, which is House Bill uh, 565. This is Delegate Fisher, um, Indigenous Peoples Day, Rule of Interpretation and Replacement of Columbus Day. Welcome, Delegate Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, the hard working members of the Health and Government, Government Operations Committee. I am back again, fourth year, very excited. And I know you all love to save the best for last. So here I am. Um, my name is Delegate Wanika Fisher, representing the Tiny But Mighty District 47B in Prince George's County, um, introducing again, um, the rule of interpretation replacement of Columbus Day. 
It's an honor for me to be able to sponsor and reintroduce this bill, um, HB 565 Indigenous Peoples Day. This bill will abolish the observance of Columbus Day on October 12th by celebrating and commemorating the true history of our Native American community. Christopher Columbus did not discover the United States as we know it, and one cannot discover something that was already inhabited by an Indigenous population. He actually is our first known human trafficker and brought Native Americans back to Spain. For decades, it has been documented that Christopher Columbus was an abuser and an oppressor of indigenous people. His brutality was notorious and devoting a holiday to this figure has caused much um, harm, not only to our indigenous populations, um, mental well-being, but also a reflection of our values. Um, this nation was already inhabited by our Native American and indigenous populations who value and protect their family, land, and culture. Unfortunately, Indigenous children, as our children, are being raised with a false sense of history and celebrating Christopher Columbus, a person who set in motion of a genocide of a people. House Bill 565 is a step towards telling that truth of our history. The impact of the Indigenous people's um, perseverance is evident throughout Maryland. Jurisdictions um, that have also submitted letters of testimony on this bill um, uh, such as Baltimore City and Prince mm -hmm. George's County have already moved forward making this change on a local level. Other states such as Michigan, Wisconsin, most notably Washington DC as well, has recently changed this holiday to Indigenous Peoples Day, along with Vermont, Maine, New Mexico, Alaska, South Dakota, Oregon, Hawaii, Louisiana, North Carolina, and, I and Iowa. We must ensure that communities are respected and recognized and honored for all their contributions. And more than ever, the truth should be known to our community, to our, our friends and neighbors as a nation, to ourselves and to our children. I hope that this committee finds it um, within, your, within your hearts and minds to finally move Maryland forward um, and replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you so much um, to this committee. I know I've showed videos um, and other materials in past years that you all have been privy to. So I didn't want to do that to you at the end of a long day again. Um, but I, you also can look back to those testimonies. I'm happy to email that um, same video out uh, to the committee as well. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, and to the committee for your time. Thank you, Delegate Fisher. Um, I'd like to, uh, would you like to cede your time to Amber Francis? Yes, and I wanted to, um, you can let my clock run if you want, but Amber is actually an intern in my office this year. And um, I would like the committee to um, give her uh, your attention and she's been a wonderful asset um, to us and, uh, and our district. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Amber, you have uh, you have your two minutes and the delegates' remaining time if you need it. And um, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Francis, and I'm a student at the University of Maryland College Park. And I'm here today to ask you to vote favorably for House Bill Five Six Five, Indigenous Peoples Day. Ever since grade school, especially during my elementary school days, I remember learning about Christopher Columbus discussing who he was and his impact on discovering undiscovered land here in America. Putting him on a pedestal as one of our founding fathers is absurd to me, but the truth being that he was a danger to the indigenous people. As I grew older, it shocked me to learn that he did absolutely nothing in the discovery of the land here because it was already occupied by the native people. These individuals were already living here way before Christopher Columbus stepped foot onto their land. It is true that he is one of the ones who paved the way for European colonization and exploitation of the Americas, in which this is not something we should celebrate and certainly not take a day off in honor of him. Celebrating him goes completely against our values as a nation and discredits the history of this indigenous people. If this day remains as Columbus Day, what is it that we're honoring and proud of as a nation exactly? The replacement of Columbus Day into Indigenous Peoples Day can bring many positives in educating our youth on the truth about America. This bill can shift honorable focus from Christopher Columbus to Indigenous people and begin a new structure for the education system, specifically in history and social studies. The implementation of this bill reveals the true tellings of the history in America. And for many years, history, social studies in schools has been tweaked and covered up. For too long, multiple groups of color have been neglected in which the time is up for that.
it's about time we begin telling the truth about our nation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for, for being here. Um, that completes the panel um, for this bill, the favorable panel. Is there Are there any questions? Any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, uh, I do want to check to make sure that John Pika and uh, Mecca Mohammed are not present. Not Madam John Pika is here. Mecca he is, is here. Oh, okay. Then and Madam Chair, I, I hate to be rude to oh. the committee. I usually stay for my whole testimony, but I have votes in the subcommittee and my oh. other jur committee of jurisdiction, if it's okay if I leave for that vote. Uh, of course it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting us know. Uh, so, so now we have an unfavorable panel and we're going to go with John Pika. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my, name, my name is John Pika and I'm testifying on behalf of the Italian American community. I chair several Italian American um, festivals and events in the um, Baltimore metropolitan area. Um, I'm also president of the or president of the organization that is replacing the Columbus statue in Baltimore <clears throat> with the statue of an anonymous immigrant. We have worked with the indigenous community through the efforts of Councilman Zeke Cohen and uh, other members of the Baltimore City Council. Uh, our focus is not on Columbus, uh, it's on that achievement. And we don't, we, we have actually changed the name of most of our celebrations to uh, the Italian American, uh, Italian Heritage Festival and other other uh, names that uh, don't focus on Columbus. Uh, every culture has its holiday. I don't see how you uh, respect or demonstrate your loyalty to one culture by uh, disrespecting another. This is the day of celebration for Italian Americans. Uh, and um, I would ask that, um, uh, and, and it's also interesting that ne neither the sponsor nor any of the advocates ever approached the Italian American community for some uh, consensus or solution uh, to this on this issue. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, it's uh, several days before crossover. I think you have many, many more important things to worry about uh, than uh, this bill. And I would ask for an unfavorable report. I intentionally did not ask members of the Italian American community to come down here and testify in the interest of time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, John. I'm going to go open for questions and I'll begin with Delegate Kaiser. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my, my question's for Mr. Pika. Uh, for all my life of celebrating Columbus Day before it was pointed out the reasons maybe we shouldn't be celebrating Columbus, never did I hear it as a reference to celebrating Italians. It was always yeah. about Columbus himself and about the um, and about the discovery of America, though we all know Leif Erikson got here first. But so I'm just wondering, um, I guess I want a little more background from you of, of how it's a celebration of Italian American heritage. I've never heard it said that way. Well, coming from someone who's 100% Italian, I hope you take my word. Um, <laughs> I think some of the older Italian Americans, and I'll be 70 on April 1st, I don't consider myself old, but a generation that really has faded away or, or is deceased, I think they celebrated Columbus. We celebrate it as a holiday. And just as an aside, Christopher Columbus made a, the route across the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to the Americas. Uh, Leif Erikson uh, chose a much safer route and he made a pit stop in Newfoundland. So what he did was not nearly as courageous as um, what Columbus did. But um, I, I, I understand your question. Um, we um, have we celebrate our Italian heritage on Columbus Day. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, toast to Christopher Columbus. We, uh, we toast to each other and the many uh, achievements Italian Americans have made uh, to culture and society uh, over centuries. So I appreciate your question, Delegate Kaiser. Uh, and I hope you take my word for it that we celebrate our heritage that day. We have right, well, 2,500 people. I'm sorry. I don't understand. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, I don't know how Newfoundland is, is a pit stop when it's America, but I'll, I'm good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Shalega. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This question would be for Mr. Pika as well. Um, so the parades and all of the stuff, my birthdays usually falls on Columbus Day, so I'm, I'm uh, very familiar with the Italian heritage uh, parades that have taken place. Um, isn't there a big one in Baltimore City? Well, we had the longest, we had the longest standing uh, consecutive parade, 129 years. We've discontinued the parade. Uh, partly as a result of some of the uh, some of the uh, press or um, some of the um, information that's uh, been spread throughout the state. Um, we do have a procession in Little Italy after uh, mass and then an Italian American Italian Heritage Festival, which attracted over 2,500 people um, through uh, through the streets of Little Italy. Um, we had that procession, but the procession is within Little Italy. So this year will be the, well, we call it a parade, but it's not nearly as large as the one that was about a mile and a half to two miles long. Uh, for 128 years, this is the 130th year, we now have a procession uh, instead of a large scale parade. Yeah, I think I've attended the celebration at the end with the amazing Italian food. Uh, so that's St. Leo's, I think. But can you give us an update on the statue that was thrown into the harbor by angry mobs? Did they ever charge anyone with that malicious destruction? And is the statue being restored and going to be put somewhere else? Uh, no, actually, uh, the demonstration started in, a, in the Mount Vernon area. And uh, about 40 police officers escorted the individuals, several hundred, right to the statue. About 40 Baltimore City police officers watched the whole thing happen. Um, we did uncover a lot of evidence, but no charges were ever made uh, against any individuals. Um, we uh, have raised about $80,000 to remodel that statue which is going to go on federal property or private property. It's not going to go back to, uh, to, the, uh, to Baltimore City. We're raising money now uh, and we'll finish our fundraising uh, in the next few months for a new statue of an anonymous immigrant. And in the piazza, which is in Little Italy, we're going to have markers um, to um, commemorate and um, um, memorialize all those who have lived in that area before the Italians, the Lumbee tribe, other indigenous uh, peoples, and um, Jew, uh, the Jewish uh, community, and African Americans. So uh, we've been working together to get some kind of consensus. And our opinion is, and the opinion of every Italian American I've ever spoken to, please enact Indigenous Peoples Day. We'll celebrate it with you will work with indigenous people the same way we have in Baltimore City, but don't take away Columbus Day. I, I just don't think it's fair. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, seeing no further questions, uh, that concludes the bill hearing on 565. I thank uh, the delegates for bringing it and those who, all those who came to speak. Um, now this concludes the work of the full committee. However, the Health Occupations and Long-Term Care Committee will be meeting 15 minutes after the close of this meeting. So it is uh, about 4.20 now, so 4.45, Delegate Kelly? Uh, 15 minutes from 4.20 is 4.35, Delegate Cullison. Oh, I was sorry. To, uh, no, I was trying to get away with something there. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I know someone might need an insurance meeting after mine, so I'm and, trying to keep right, things efficient. And, uh, and thank you. And 15 minutes after the close of that subcommittee, the um, insurance and pharmaceutical subcommittee will take up where it left off this morning. So um, for those who have bills in, in those committees, please um, watch for when they are beginning and ending. With that, uh, this meeting is adjourned.